Welcome guys, this is going to be a uh, an overview of the media representations of crime session. So this could be a talk session to cover page 80 to 89 in your packs. And we're going to look at how the media represents crime and deviance. Now to do this, you're going to need your pack to, to follow through the materials, fill it in as we go. Uh, take breaks, pause the video at certain points if you want to read a task or complete a task. Um, so I will kind of flag up times to, to pause and, and complete a task. Once you have finished these pages, um, there's also a summary, short summary recap video, which I've also created, which I will attach to the email, which I send the links to this video. But this that video is also in uh, on the channel below. OK, so let's get to it. So we can look at the media representations of crime. So the first thing to get you thinking is this task that we're talking page 80 is to think about the idea that we live in a media saturated society the perfect example of this already being the fact that you are watching a lesson on youtube on your phones or on your computer at home um, and that's probably just one piece of technology and media that you have used in um, your short period today so we are able to access a wide range of media um, almost constantly but the media we access has become obsessed with crime has become quite a central theme in crime and uh, sorry, media output. And the media has become our main source of knowledge about crime. What we know, what we think, who we assume to be involved, how we feel about crime, and also what we fear about crime. All of this comes from the media representations of it. Um, and the best thing to think about is, is if you think about what crime related products have you consumed? As we've been off, you know, what have you been watching on Netflix? What have you watched on telly? What have you been listening to? So these are really kind of key questions to think about with the media and crime that we are consuming media and crime products through the media almost on a daily basis. Um, and this is what Hayward and Young uh, talk about as, as you know, the idea that crime has become a consumer spectacle. So it's a tool of selling a product. Most films, most fiction, most music has a connection to crime or sort of criminal sort of elements within them. Just as some examples of media products that relate to crime, think of all the films, all the TV programs, all the series on Netflix, music, books, um, even fashion in some respects. Hoodies uh, obviously have their connections being worn by people who obviously commit acts of deviance, but obviously as a, as a sort of a fashion item developed out sort of that sort of youth subcultures. Um, so this is kind of what we're thinking about um, in terms of, of media relating to crime. Now that brings us on to media representation of crime just on the bottom of page 80. And again, how this influences public perception of crime. So as you can see, the difference between tabloid newspapers and broadsheet newspapers is how much they how much space they give to criminal uh, interest stories and how much crime and demons appears in newspapers. So as you can see, Williams and Dickinson found that sort of tabloid newspapers like The Sun, um, The Mirror, sort of some of those sort of newspapers would give up to about 30 percent of their front cover to uh, stories relating to crime and deviants. Uh, more broadsheet newspapers would probably give a much more sort of smaller proportion of their paper to those kinds of stories, around about 5%. Um, and what Williams and Dickinson found is that 65% of newspapers um, reported violent crimes, despite really violent crime only making up about 6% of all the crimes in the UK. So there's this misrepresentation, this over-representation of violent crime that is not in proportion to the reality of crime and deviance. Um, and if you do ever watch the the Michael Moore documentary Bowling for Columbine? Um, obviously, it highlighted one of the things in there, which is is a really good documentary, and I would recommend watching it if you can get access to it. Um, but one of the things he talks about is the idea of the, that crime stats in America, kind of as they are released, and it showed that homicide rate had fallen by about twenty percent. News coverage of murder and violence had increased by about 600%. So again, the way media reports crime doesn't reflect 
the reality of crime. And it's this idea, of, as it says in your pack, about the perception or misrepresentation of crime. Now, with this as well, we've also got a couple of other key thinkers. So you've got um, Marsh, who again highlights that, that violent crime is overreported, but you've also got Felsen. And Felsen's a really good thinker here because he talks about this idea of the age fallacy and the dramatic fallacy. Now, the age fallacy is this idea that, that most media representations of crime show that victims are often older. It highlights older people as more likely to be victims. The dramatic fallacy is that may, newspapers are more likely to cover quite uh, sensational, quite unique, quite dramatic news stories. And that's going to pop up a little bit later when we talk about something called news values. And then you've got Soret, um, who talks about backwards law. Um, but we're going to come back to the backwards law in just a second. So the media misrepresents crime. It gives a distorted view. Just as an example of this, we've got some uh, newspaper covers. Now, this is from a couple of years ago. It's from um, 2016. Well, what had happened, you'll see, there was the, the 2016 Euros uh, and there have been clashes between Russian fans and English fans. Uh, and obviously some these all links to football hooliganism. And violence. And I wanted just to show you the comparison of how these three newspapers reported the same story on the same day. So you can see on the far left, we've got the Daily Star. So a, a, a sort of textbook tabloid paper. And you can see big chunk of the front page cover, aside from the ads and the banner and obviously the fact it's you know, the cost being emphasised. But that's most of the front page. Russian ultras attack England, the Wales fans. Uh, that's their, their main story. Now, the Metro is somewhere, it's kind of a, it's not quite a full tabloid paper. It's a, it's the free paper you get with the, um, on transport networks, but it kind of fits somewhere in between. And you can see on their front cover, they've got a slightly, it's still the big topic on the front page, very at the top of the page, but it's not the main story. You can see Osborne uh, plays the tax card on Brexit. That's, that's kind of, this is the main story, but this is obviously a substantial part of the front cover um, and it will pop up in a second but you can also see that they have this second crime related story on their front cover so again quite a big chunk about half their front page on crime and then far right you see the garden which will come under sort of the the, the broadsheet category I imagine but that's where their discussion of the same football violence incident is kind of covered so a very small proportion of their front page cover so this is obviously the idea about news coverage that that the way newspapers present crime creates a misrepresentation of it and one of the big things about this as well is you think about the social class of readers so um obviously we're looking if we sort of kind of create this arrow of, of social class obviously towards this end you're going to have more likely to be working class readers and then towards this end you're probably going to have more middle class readers um and again, the idea being that, that this could explain why the working class have a greater fear of crime, apart from obviously being more likely to experience it, but the greater fear comes from the, the misrepresentation of crime in their stories. So that brings us to the backwards laws that Rayner introduced. Now, Rayner kind of talks about, uh, or Greer and Rayner, sorry, talk about these backwards laws. This is also mentioned by Surrett. Um, and again, the idea that the media exaggerate the risk of victimisation. So if I just put these up on the screen, I'll give you a chance. You can pause the video um, so you can write these down into your pack. Um, so I'll just put a little stop here. So if you want to pause, oh, there you go, pause it. OK, so obviously you hopefully you've unpaused by now. Um, so just to quickly talk through what you, you hopefully have copied down into your pack. So the backwards law is it kind of fits in with this dramatic fallacy and the idea that media constructs images of crime, which are what uh, is called a backwards misrepresentation. So basically the, the, the media misrepresents crime is a backwards representation. So uh, hugely overrepresents and exaggerates drug, sex and violent crime, uh, portrays property crimes as far more serious than those which are actually reported and most property crimes quite generally routine involves little loss little violence little damage 
but they're not reported. It's the ones that are quite extreme and severe. Um, so the most recent one I can think of was in Essex a couple of, I think it was last year, there was someone, you know, their house was burgled at gunpoint and the robbers had sawn off shotguns and it was kind of very sort of 1960s gangster heist sort of style crime. And that made it into the press because it had that idea of violence, the threat, the get of the guns. It was quite extreme. Um, they over exaggerate the police effectiveness. So, again, most stories that we hear involve the police detecting, catching an offender because that's that's kind of what we want to hear. Um, so it creates this narrative that the police are more effective at clearing up and solving crimes than, than the reality. Uh, it over exaggerates the risk of victimisation for those who are white, rich, older um, and who are women and children. So this, this uh, age and sort of or age fallacy. So old, rich women are more likely to be victims of crime. But the reality statistically is that it's young working class males. And number five is that emphasis of individual incidents of crime rather than providing an understanding or analysis of patterns of crime. So, again, most coverage of mass shootings in America emphasise this this individual incident and, and also this individual events, but it doesn't really look at the greater, wider patterns. So um, we're going to see this a second in, in agenda setting. So the Pulse nice cl nightclub shooting that took place um, again in 2016, um, that was a massive mass shooting in, um, I think it was in a gay nightclub in um i think it was in florida or miami one of those areas um now again that made mass news coverage because again the, the assault the shooter went in with an assault rifle he um you know he killed you know loads and loads of people and injured and injured loads and loads of people and there's a lot of folks on him and the club and the victims and text messages from the victims as they sent off to people just before they were killed um but what wasn't covered was that in america um you know, there were 136 separate mass shootings between January and June. So in a six month window, there was 136 mass shootings, only seven. Um, sorry, seven of which occurred in the same week as the poll shooting, but none of those received international coverage. So that's obviously one of these big issues of the back was all the misrepresentation of crime. OK, so this uh, this article just on your screen in a second, that was the, the one that's in your pack and that relates to the Pulse shooting. Um, so it was 50 dead in that uh, um, uh, Florida shooting. Um, but as I say, that that mass shooting was one of 136 that had taken in a, a place in a six month window in America. Seven other mass shootings took place in the same week. But this was the one that gained international coverage. And the same happened a few months later when there was the mass shooting in, in Nevada and the guy in the hotel room was firing a crowd out of his window and you know killed again dozens and dozens of people but there were loads of other mass shootings that that week alone that, that didn't receive the same level of coverage and part of this is to do with these concepts of agenda setting and news values and we'll just flag these up um, because I think they are really important for the next few pages so the idea of an agenda setting as you can see here now, the agenda setting is the ability to set the narrative, set the tone um, that the public will see of a news item. Um, and the idea that if it's a news item that's covered frequently, prominently, the audience will regard it, the issue as is more important. So it's to set the, the notion of what is considered to be important, what is on the agenda for news discussion. And again, this is linked to would be the people who own newspapers, who own these companies or management companies of the news. They can set the agenda. Uh, news values are generally, um, another concept we're talking about, news values are general guides about the criteria to determine how much uh, a news story should make it into the press, how important is that story. Um, and obviously the last few about relevance to crime. So agenda setting, and news values determine how much media, uh, how the media represents crime and how influential it would be for people um, and how they understand crime. So a couple of things for you to do before we kind of look at some examples is you've got the definition of news values here. So if you can add that to page 
81, just at the bottom of the page. Um, and then we're going to talk about how news values, social construction, agenda set, and how these things link together. Um, and actually, the answer to that is this little bit here about relevancy to crime. So the idea that agenda set and news values determine how the media represents crime and how influential it's going to be on us. So you may want to pause this slide for a second just to make some notes. But just some examples of agenda setting. Um, so just thinking about sort of some of these these newspapers like The Sun and The Daily Mail, but, you know, the, the narrative is EU migrants and, and you know, the rapists and how the borders are full and, and very anti-EU. And you can think that um, the leaders of those three papers, again, are, have been very anti-EU. And so they set the narrative, they set the tone, they set the agenda for how these stories are presented. OK. So let's move on to news values and the coverage of crime. So I'm going to talk about a few things for you. Most of this is filled in in your pack. So it's just a case of, of reading and highlighting as we go. So we're going to think about stories that apply to Jenks's, or sorry, Duke's um, news values. And I've got some examples that I want to show you just because I think they um, kind of demonstrate some of the key features. But we'll talk about what the news values are. So the media representations of crime. So first of all, the news is a social construct. It doesn't exist there in, in the real world. It's, it's created by journalists. So the news and the media are social constructs. And we've seen this already with the work of Cohen, with Young, um, and even with the, the news values of Dukes. And that the news is manufactured in the sense of creating news values. Now, the news values that we have, and again, all 12 are in your pack, but ultimately, you know, is the story going to be of interest to the public? Is there a dramatic or exciting element? Is there a personalization? You know, has it got human interest? You know, how close is uh, the audience to the seriousness of the crime? Um, are there higher status persons, celebrities involved? Is it can it easily or simply be presented to the audience? Does it involve sex and violence? Are there any graphic images or CCTV images that can be used on newspaper covers and story headlines? Is there a novelty element to it? Um, children as either offenders or victims often has a higher news value to the stories. Does it involve an element of risk or feature someone who's vulnerable, afraid, risk of being harmed? And is there an element of violence? So these are the key news values that Jukes talks about. Now, as an example of a story that has a lot of these news values, think back to 2013 with Oscar Pistorius um, and he shoots his girlfriend. Now, again, think about those news values. You know, we've got the dramatic, you know, shoots his girlfriend. You've got um, the highest status celebrity person. It's quite a simplified story headline. So you can understand what's happened quite easily. There's elements of violence. Um, I suppose there's the, the sort of it wasn't sort of graphic image, but maybe the novelty, because it is a, you know, he was a celebrity Paralympian. The fact he thinks he's being robbed and he shoots through the bathroom door and kills his girlfriend. It, so there's a lot of, um, this would be a very good example of a news value story. It has high news values. As a, on a side note, again, not a specific news value, but um, the sort of newspapers like The Star and The Mirror, they tend to produce a lot of these stories. Um, of generally the, the sort of celebrity sex dwarf killed by an animal story that seemed to do the rounds very frequently. So Jeremy Corbyn, sex dwarf eaten by otters. Gordon Ramsay, sex dwarf eaten by badgers. Uh, Boris, sex dwarf drowns in a giant trifle. These again, tick a lot of news values because it's, you know, uh, it's celebrity, it's novelty, it's got sex and death. And I assume a majority of these are all fake stories. I mean, they're they're just so bizarre. And daily sport um, seems to knock out these these sex dwarf stories on a daily or weekly basis. So I imagine, as I say, these are these are probably all fake. But 
it, it, that they kind of it's the news value element of them all. Um, why they kind of seem to to keep appearing. Okay, so as for some non sex dwarf related stories with news values, we have these ones here. So let's clear the screen. So you can see, again, just fitting this example of what is a news value. Uh, you've got the Duke of Cambridge appears on um, the cover for Attitude, so a Gay Times magazine. Um, and again, that, that has that celebrity uh, element to it. Uh, for number two, Orlando, dra uh, sorry, Alligator drags boy into water near Orlando Disney Resort. Again, it has the children involved. There's there's violence. There's danger. There's the novelty. There's an animal. Um, there's also the I suppose the personalization that people have been to Disney Orlando and maybe are aware of the sort of premises and that sort of stuff. Number three would be Cla uh, Clement Freud uh, was obviously a Liberal MP, um, got well renowned Liberal MP, but again found to have abused children. So again, we've got celebrity, sex, violence, children. Um, and again, a story that can be uh, quite simply presented. Um, number four, the online choking game led to boy's death. So we've got the novelty, children, violence, you've got the drama, drama I suppose, involved. And then lastly, the Tower Hamlet school uh, defends hiring a racist killer. So again, a school who hires like a, some kind of, I think it's a cleaner or a handyman, has a history of, of, of violence. Um, and again, school. So again, it has that, that a lot of these news values that we've covered. So what impact does that have on what we see and think? about crime and deviance. So in your pack you've got just some examples about Rainer Katz. Um, they're talking about news values, they talk about moral dilemmas and the risk taking behaviour um, that can be encouraged through crime. So if we look at this question it says outline three ways in which the media affects how we see and think about crime. So six marker. So three points. If you just want to pause this video for uh, a couple of minutes here, read the bottom page 82 and see if you can come up with three points so effectively. And then what I'll do is I'll put some on the screen in a second. So you've got a chance to pause the video. If you are ready, we'll click on and look at the answers. So some of the things I picked up on. So you could talk about how we think about crime, you could talk about news values. So again, the idea that the stories that the news represents are the ones that have the most um, interest or most likely to get viewers or readers and may not necessarily be a true reflection of the realities of crime and defense. Uh, I talked a little bit about cats with the idea that there is this public demand you know that the newspapers will keep publishing stories about crime because we want it we want to hear it we want to see it so there is the demand from the um the public which is why we seem to have more um stories from crime uh there's a focus on the role of the offender rather than the impact on the victim so again a lot of the stories focus on the the, the offender and what they did rather than focus on the victim and again, you can almost, again, Katz talks about how this could create this notion that risk taking behaviour is more attractive and exciting and could encourage some form of deviant behaviour. So, uh, again, this is kind of how the media affects crime. Now, what we also have on page 83 is the hyper reality, the fear of crime that's created. Um, now, this is a combination of lots of things, the backwards law, the agenda setting, news values, uh, the media being a socially constructed representation of crime. All of this comes back to Baudrillard's hyper reality, as you can see on page 83. And the idea about hyper reality is that it creates this 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 view of crime, this expectation, this feeling of crime, which does not have any basis in the outside world is not a true reflection of crime and deviance. So it does fit in with all the points you've looked at. Um, and as I said, you can identify 
lots of uh, news stories that you may have seen that relate to crime. Probably not as many doing the rounds at the moment, particularly because of the corona outbreak. But if you think about um, the most recent crime story I can think that does have an overlap, corona, was the, the group of young people who were arrested for um, coughing and spitting at police officers in, you know, threatening to give them corona by coughing and spitting at them. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of a, quite an unusual crime. It's not a common thing to happen. Uh, but again, it was reported a lot in the press. So when it comes to the media and crime, it, there is this fictional level of crime. So think about 25% of prime TV, 20% of films are crime shows or movies, but are a fictional representation of crime. And often these representations focus on the murder, violence, sex crimes being overrepresented. Fictional murders are based on greed and calculation, whereas real life murder is mainly a result of fights and domestic violence. Uh, fictional sex crimes are committed by psychopathic strangers, as opposed to reality being acquaintances. Fictional villains tend to be high status, middle aged, white males, not young working class ethnic minority men. And lastly, the fictional police always or usually get their man. So, again, this is part adds to this, this fictional narrative of crime. Mm -hmm. Crime reality TV also blurs the boundary between news and fiction and doesn't actually help with this, this hyper reality. So programs like, um, the, like Crime Watch, you know, they attract large numbers of audiences. And again, they focus on uh, murder, robbery, violence, sex crimes. And again, it often is either reporting that they've, they've solved the case or they're appealing for support to do it. And they've got lots of evidence and got lots of material to help with that. So again, you can probably think of lots of reality crime programs. So again, on Netflix, the number of documentaries, which again, are about reality crime cases, I think the one doing around at the moment is like the Tiger King, and which is you know linked to um, sort of assassinations and, and you know guns for hire and all that. So there's there's obviously a very unrealistic representation of crime within that. Which comes back to my point about the fear of crime. So as you can see here on this graph, I'll just quickly explain what these mean. So the red line represents people who think crime is going up. So this is the representation of uh, national patterns of people thinking crime has increased. And if you imagine, um, again, these are sort of 10 years old, these stats, but nationally, the sort of general trend is that people feel crime is increasing, uh, particularly 2008-2009, whereas in my local area, the general pattern is down. So the idea being that people don't think about crime in their area, but they think nationally crime is going up. Uh, same with this uh, different graph. So again, with the British Crime Survey, you can see that obviously the number of offences being recorded um, on the British Crime Survey. You can see this big increase um, up until about 98, 99. But then general trend is that there's a decline in crime rates. Police recorded crime, you know, there isn't much, um, you know, it does kind of go up and then it does go down. But it also highlights the difference between the British Crime Survey and the police crime stats. But ultimately, again, the idea that there's been this decline in crime, but people have a growing fear of being a victim of crime. Now, this leads us to page 84. And again, as we go through, anytime you want to pause this um, to have a read, I'd encourage you to do so and then come back to the video at any point. So this is how does the media cause crime? How is the media crime related to crime deviance? So um, there's a few things that you can look at. So you can read page 84 to 86 in your pack, and it does cover uh, some examples of how the media can cause crime, particularly, um, I think what's a good example is, is the blue story when that was released in cinemas. And there's a little extract about that, a news story from that on page 86. But I'll say have a read of, of Fatis and Drill music and his overview and then come back to these questions. Think about um, what these questions show. If you get stuck, or obviously email me, email the teacher 
um, and we can go through those with you. But jumping to the top of 84, I just want to talk about how the media has been seen as a source of crime. So throughout the years, the media has always been feared as causing crime. In the 1920s, it was the cinema corrupting young people. Um, in the 50s, it was, you know, comic books was leading to moral decline. In the 60s, it was music, consumer products that was going to corrupt young people. And again, around here, you've got like Cohen and the mods and rockers. Um, 1980s, it would have been the video nasties and horror films. In the 90s, it was a move towards rave culture, drug use, uh, obviously terrorism. Um, and in the noughties, so sort of it was, you know, rap. Um, you know, there's the knife crime, horse meat scandals, dangerous dogs, chavs, and even in the 2010s, we're sort of seeing more of a shift towards social media being a cause of crime for young people. Um, so particularly stuff like the dark web and Snapchat being used to facilitate drug dealing um, or, or self-harm being encouraged through social media. So have a read of the article about drill music again it kind of highlights how the media is seen as a source of crime and again i'm just going to leave this on the screen for a second so you can pause it and have a look at this in your own time but again some other examples of how the media is seen as a cause of crime there's a little bit of theory behind it so particularly i like this this notion of the hypodermic syringe um, model so the idea that that you become desensitized to violence and crime um, because you absorb so much of it through the media. So again, there's um, a few kind of studies on here that aren't in the pack, but I think are, are worth recognising. All you have to do is just pause the screen and take a read of those, or take a screenshot of the screen. Okay, so that brings us to, so the ways the media can represent crime is the next bit. Now this Greer and Rayner who pop up again, um, now this is again a different way how the media causes crime. So what they suggest is that there are these um, the way media can create crime is through encouraging it, imitation to create arousal, which can lead to people turning to crime. It can be a source of desensitization. Again, for that, that almost the hypodermic syringe, that repeat viewing of crime and deviance. Uh, it can transmit knowledge and techniques. It can provide the hardware um, and sort of train people into to providing the, the facilities to commit crime, so Snapchat or the dark web. Um, it can stimulate desire for unachievable or unaffordable goods. So again, that, that relative deprivation, that, that spread of information through the media. Um, it can portray the police as incompetent and it can glamorize offending. So again, this is all the way the media can cause crime. Um, now, some evaluations of that, you've got Scram, who talks about how you know being exposed to violence in the media doesn't affect people that much even children it can have a limited effect on children most children who see violent stuff on tv are unaffected sparks also takes this interpreter's approach so we must consider the meanings that people get from viewing violence so um you know this you know i've seen a violent cartoon and watching a violent film are different versions of violence and we will understand them, interpret them in different ways. Now, just below uh, these kind of ways in which media cause crime, you've also got the how the way, uh, the way, sorry, in which the media can emphasise relative deprivation. So this is a bit of a throwback to earlier studies. So the very first one is the left realism argument, particularly Lee and Young, which um, you can find on page 42 to 43. And then you've got strain theory and Merton, which you have on page eight. So I'd say go back through your packs and can you bring those forward summary, sorry, theories forward? I'll make a little note here because again, it just highlights the synoptic links in this topic. Now, as again, carried on with synoptic links, as we mentioned, we've got moral panics popping up again. So we've done a lot on Cohen and a lot on Hall with moral panics. Um, and again, you can fill in the summaries on the bottom of page 86 and uh, the top of um, 87. So Cohen, the moral panics, the folk devils, uh, who you would have looked at earlier on page 34 to 35. So go back and just take a quick look over moral panics. We also talked about Hall and police in the crisis. Um, that was the, the study on mugging. 
and the full theory of Devens. So that was page 21 to 23 in your pack. So again, highlighting synoptic overlap. Can you go back, read those information, pop it into the tables on the top of page 87 there for you? Um, but again, really, really important sort of studies that relate to the media and crime. Now, just as a sort of slightly updated view of moral panics, some other examples of moral panics from the last couple of years, obviously, would be um, obviously terrorism. You've got the sort of horse meat scandal, dangerous dogs, dangerous drugs and overdoses, the legal highs. You've got immigration and crime related to immigration, pushed a lot by the right wing press. And the last one was drones and the peeping toms through drones. Now, when it comes to criticisms of moral panics, Again, a lot of the criticisms come from the concept itself. So again, that social reaction is an over the top reaction, but who says it's over the top? Um, the media can amplify particular crimes compared to others. And there's a lack of consensus about what is deviant, particularly in a post-modern age. So with this in mind, on page 87, there's a short summary uh, set of bullet points on whether moral panics are useful or not. And I think this is a really good evaluative point, particularly when talking about moral panics as an issue. So just as a summary there, the key things about moral panics is that Robin Fulton say that moral panic is no longer useful. It's outdated. So we don't have the same notion of newspapers and media as we did in the past. So we don't have um, one news story a day. We have constant updates for YouTube, bloggers, vloggers, Facebook, Twitter. You know, we are constantly updated by the news. Most stories have a short shelf life because of that. So again, stories that have the legwork to keep going as a moral panic need to be uh, quite substantial. And Hall often referred to moral panics as a zombie concept. So you talk about them still existing and being alive. But the reality is they don't really exist or aren't as powerful today as they were in the past. So just as we kind of move into the last few bits in this pack really, really quickly. So one of the examples of how moral panic has lost its power is that young people do not consume media in the same way. So social media outstrips TV as a source for news for young people. Again, highlighted why it's difficult for a moral panic to take hold. Um, we've also got the case study here about the dark side of the, um, or oh, sorry, the not so dark side of the dark net, which is a good qualitative study. So I'll put a little extract about the dark net in there for you to have a read of. There's a full article which I will send to you um, for a read if you'd like to. And that brings us to last page 88 and technological advances. Now, when it comes to technology and crime, I'll put these up on the screen and you can pause this and write them into your pack. But technology has changed the way crime can occur. So we see cyber trespass crossing boundaries into other people's cyber property. We see cyber theft and deception has become bigger and more prominent. Cyber pornography and cyber violence. So we see this, this changing nature of crime demons because of technology. And this can have its pros and cons. So again, they're on the bottom page 88 to read. Then you've got consolidation tasks on page 89 for you to attempt. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about is exam questions. Again, just to give you an idea of what could appear, what kind of things you would expect if you did them. Again, you can do these in four if you want me to mark them. Um, but, that, but that's not a, a, I'm not setting that as a task for you to do this week. So just some examples of questions here. We've got outline two ways in which the media give a distorted view of crime. Uh, outline three news values that may influence the reporting of crime. So they're quite straightforward questions. The 10 marker here, why sociologists claim the media does not just report crime, but may uh, be the cause of it. So again, two ways in which the media is a cause of crime. So again, thinking back to sort of ways in which media can create criminal behavior and then the 30 marker follows a similar pattern 
So sociological contributions to our understanding of the relationship between crime and the media. So again, gives you the full range to about all the different issues of media and crime. Okay, I know this has been quite a long video. So just to sum it up, um, use this to fill in your pack. If you want a shorter summary, there's a shorter 15 minute overview of medium crime, which as again, it be a short one to watch. Other than that, let me know if you had any issues and thanks for watching.